Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending session three of the IBR webinar series. As a reminder to all participants, this webinar is public and is being recorded. The registration information was posted on the NERC website and widely distributed. Speakers on the call should keep in mind that the listening audience may include members of the press and representatives of various governmental authorities, in addition to the expected participation by industry stakeholders. Should you wish to ask a question during today's webinar, please use the Q&A feature. It is NERC's policy and practice to obey the antitrust laws and to avoid all conduct that unreasonably restrains competition. This policy requires the avoidance of any conduct that violates or that might appear to violate the antitrust laws. Any NERC participant that is uncertain about the legal ramifications of a particular course of conduct or who has doubts or concerns about whether or not NERC's antitrust compliance is implicated in any situation should consult NERC's general counsel immediately. At this time, we'll hear a few words from Alex Shadrick. Stuck on mute. Thanks, Lucha. Uh, we're getting started. Oh, jump right in. Uh, this is our third webinar. Uh, we've seen some IBR basics and we've seen uh, some presentations on you know, what disturbances are happening and what they you know how those get mitigated and investigated and now we're going to move in uh to our third webinar which is going to be you know inverter based resource performance issues so we have some uh some industry representatives who have kaiso and tva and ERCOT, um and they're going to talk about what kind of ibr performance issues they're seeing so we can kind of see you know what what to look out for as the energy transition is happening here um like the future said if you have a question uh please put it in the q a uh the questions in the q a are going to get you know, concatenated and been posted along with the meeting materials after the webinar series um, as kind of a frequently asked questions and um, and that kind of thing. So that those those answers are are there for everyone to see um, after the webinar series. So just make sure we have uh, plenty of time moving forward. We're going to jump right in and we're going to start with Didi from uh, Kaiso. All right. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the time. And let's uh, get started. My name is Didi Subakti. I'm currently serving as a vice president of system operations. So for the next 10 minutes, I'll talk about how California is experience in managing the growth and monitoring of the infrastructure based resources that we have. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, next couple of slides is just really just uh, pictures to paint the pictures of where we are right now. Uh, I think many of you know that there is a need for new resources to meet California long-term need, and it actually has escalated quite quickly. And we're this is just a state agency resource plan provided to the ISO for from our transmission planning perspective. And if you look at this from the 10 years horizon, well, it's really ex ex uh, increasing exponentially, and uh, the big yellow there is the solar and then the big blue there is a battery so you know if you look at the 2020 plan 2021 plan 2022 all the way to the 20 year outlook there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of infrastructure based resources that particularly in california so will be in the in the form of solar as well as battery energy storage so goes to the next slide this is just a different uh, <clears throat> different look uh, this is actually a large volume of renewable resources that competing to be part of that supply uh, as shown in our interconnection queue um, so this is just a snapshot of the inter in the connection queue and you could kind of see there uh, uh, the best the, which is the battery energy storage uh, the, uh, the solar and the wind as you can see that the big chunk of this is is, is solar pv solar and uh Buck electric, uh, sorry, battery uh, energy storage. Now, this is just the one that is in our queue, right? This is the one that is connected to California ISO. This is this is not including, you know, behind the meter stuff, uh, rooftop solar and whatnot. So this is just the one that's connected to our grid. So that two slides should give you a picture, paint the broad pictures of where we are in California ISOs and where we are thinking we're heading with regards to our uh, resources for the next 10 years. Um, now, uh, many of you have um, known, have, have heard about some of the performance issue that we observe. Uh, so slide four, if we could go to the next slide, here is just a summary of the <clears throat> recent IBR. This is primarily PV solar. Um, so you you you've heard about many of this. I think uh, if you if you join some of the um, uh, 
uh, the webinar in the in, in, in before the webinar series, you've heard uh, our um, folks talks about blue cut fire, canyon to fire, angel force. I mean, you've you've heard about all this. Uh, so we've actually started seeing this back in 2016, and every year we have one, and it's the the volume has actually been, uh, you know. It's actually improving because now you can see that the, the size is actually smaller and smaller. Uh, and in 2022, we have some event in 2022 as well. I didn't include the 2022 event here, uh, but it's kind of, you know, the, the IBR losses is, is getting, the megawatt is getting smaller, smaller, uh, showing an improvement. So uh, if we go to the next slide, I want to um, explain a little bit about where we have been. Um, and many of you probably know about this, and many probably don't. Uh, so maybe so when the the first wake up call for us in California is the, is the Blue Cut Fire, right? So the Blue Cut Fire occurred in August 16, 2016, uh, almost uh, almost seven years ago, I think now. Uh, now it's uh, already June 2023. So almost seven years ago, we 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 knew about this. Uh, we saw this in August 2016. So we did the collaborations with industry. Three, identifying resolve uh, resolve a number of the frequency calculations. I think you all heard uh, the work that we've done with uh, inverter manufacturers and whatnot. Uh, I think it was last week. I mean, are actually that that the vendor uh, talk about some of this. It's, it's very cool. So we have uh, we have a lot of work in there. And then in May 2018, uh, California ISO actually submitted two two SAR uh, to NERC, uh, and we had a recommended recommended uh, clarification to PRC24 for write-through, uh, you know, some expanded existing standard to include IBR requirement. Um, at that time, uh, in May 2018, uh, around that time, uh, the SARS were rejected at, at the standard committee. Now, of course, you know, this is back in 2018. Um, there, there were only very few events that occur, right? So you had an event on 2016, event 2017, event 2018. So at that point in time, um, I think there was questions about whether or not this is a regional issue, California issue, or is this a nationwide issue, or you know, is a global industry issue. So. <clears throat> Anyway, here that's 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 just the history. Uh, the SAR was rejected at the standard committee, and because of the SAR was rejected in the standard committee, we we saw that we need this, so we we put our own tariff revision. We actually work with uh, we are FERC's jurisdictions. We our tariff is approved with FERC, so we go we went with uh, we went with the tariff route. And on April 2019, uh, we had a number of tariff revisions for anything that isn't connected interconnecting to California. So. Uh, uh, interconnection requirement for IBRs, right through requirement, modeling requirement. Uh, also, we initiated this business practice manual, uh, which is which working with uh, our uh, transmission planning uh, process on the modeling and all those uh, good stuff in there. Um, now, uh, with, with the tariff, uh, everything that gets in place uh, can um, can be implemented. The requirement is implemented for any interconnection that move forwards, right? It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't necessarily look back. It doesn't have stuff for for the thing that is in the past, but it's for anything new that comes in would have that uh, all this requirement based on the tariff that uh, that we filed uh, based on the work on the 2019. So it's still an ongoing effort. It's still a journey. Um, there is a participation of the. Uh, we currently California ISO still have a participation of the current drafting teams and committee in the NERC. We have collaborations with our participating transmission owners with uh, the IBR related integration issues, the model update, and 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 also we we are doing our event analysis. Uh, so the next few slides, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, what our ongoing effort is. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide talks about the modeling. Uh, this is a comprehensive model data review uh, that has been made significant progress. Has is a daunting task for the industry, right? We 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 face it. We prioritize by, based on the impact, and uh, we collect all this uh, uh, modeling data, uh, EMT. Uh, so if there's an EMT pen, an EMT model pending, and all of stuff. This is an example. We have uh, phase one, two, three, four, and all those stuff, and we actually 
have a uh, we put this as a tariff requirement, right? So if uh, if people are not giving us a model, uh, we collect penalty. So um, this is actually an older number here. I didn't calculate a newer number, but it's about you know uh, three quarter of a million dollars penalty, seven hundred thirty nine thousand. No, those are dollar. <laughs> those are a penalty for for people who are not providing uh, the uh, the data uh, in in there. So a lot of work in, in the planning side uh, to actually collect the model that is in there. So that's one effort. The second effort is going to the next slide. Is um, it's the monitoring procedure. So there is a procedures review here. Now this is probably an eye chart, but it basically says, you know, for every single event, now California ISO is, uh, our peak load is about 50,000 megawatt. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have a lot of this. We have a lot of large size, a lot of small size. So we have to put some type of a, uh, a threshold. So we monitor a loss of over 500 megawatt with regards to um, event analysis, right? So we have 500 megawatt. Uh, if we is more than 500 megawatt we always look at it and then if we say that you know is it is it because of the there is an EI IBR reduction that is greater than 250 megawatt so right now we are looking at the thing that is if there is a IBR reductions of greater than 250 megawatt on the event that is 500 megawatt uh, and then we would actually send uh, data requests for each of the IBR for uh, that that is greater than 10 megawatt reduction so if, so that's that's kind of like the, the the sequence. We look at 500 megawatt loss of resources, and then from there we look at is a 250 megawatt um, cumulative IBR. And if there is, then we send all the affected IBR that has a, uh, that has a 10 megawatt reduction. Uh, and then we review it. If there is a proper IBR operation, that's yeah okay. If it is not, then we'll have to develop mitigations plan with the IBR. And then that's basically the bigger uh, pictures of the flow charts of what we are doing in the, in the monitoring. Uh, my last slide, which is the next slide, is really just you know, an ask, an ask for the industry, and an ask for the assistance from NERC for us. Uh, really, uh, you know, we've we, we've 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 been we've been a proponent uh, of having a reliability standard for IBR, fast track where it's possible. As as you as as I mentioned, we 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 started the request for SAR back in 2018 because we saw that this could impact anybody, not just California. So I think it will be good to have uh, their reliability standards, and the reliability standard would allow us to also, you know, retroactively apply to everybody else that is in there, and it's not just moving forward based on our tariff because that our tariff could only do the stuff that's moving forward. Um, and then, you know. I know we are asking around, and we see, we are seeing a lot of stuff in in the uh, standard uh, in the SAR now, uh, and we're all busy. So maybe we could prioritize efforts utilizing a risk-based approach, uh, which is you know the performance standards and the model quality. To, to for us, uh, the two big items uh, that that should probably be prioritized is is the performance standards and the model quality, so that we can actually have a model and performance matching right at the, at the end of the day. Um, and there is also this talk about modification. Of BES definition, uh, including IBR resources below the current threshold. So that's uh, that's this area of uh, questions and assistance and and things that we believe that it will be very useful if we if the industry can get together and rally around this. So uh, that's kind of like my uh, my piece, my informations for today, and then uh, and then we'll I'll be uh, available for Q and A later. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Didi. Uh, very good to see. What y'all are facing and kind of your your idea for the next paths forward because I think it aligns right with uh, you know the rest of the industry. We all gotta work together and, and get these under control and make sure they're reliably operating. So thanks very much. We're gonna jump right in to Jeff from ERCOT, and he's gonna tell us uh, ERCOT's perspective. Thanks, Alex. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and just sorry, I should introduce myself. Uh, so Jeff Billow with ERCOT Operations Planning. And just a, a quick introduction for the ERCOT system. For those who aren't as familiar, uh, we are an island system with a very limited, just, just over a gigawatt of DC tie uh, capacity with uh, both Eastern Interconnect and, and the uh, Mexican system. Uh, and to put that in context, we have a peak load of about 80 gigawatts. Uh, so with that background, uh, let's go to the next slide. So when 
uh, Ryan and Alex asked me to present on ERCOT's experience with IBR performance issues. I, I thought it would be good to provide some historical perspective. And uh, as I, I was thinking about, okay, if, if somebody wrote a book on a history book on ERCOT's IBR experience, not, not that anybody would actually want to buy that book and read that book, but if, if someone did, uh, what would be the, the chapters or the sections that, that would uh, be put into that book? And, and I listed in the boxes at, at the bottom of the, the slide there, I, I think some, uh, certainly not all, but I think some of the, the chapters uh, that would go into that history book. Uh, and actually, I'm, I want to start a little bit before uh, the, the 2008 there. I want to go back to January of 2004, which is when I started at ERCOT. And shortly after I started, uh, there was a, a lady on the, the uh, on my team who was uh, given the assignment of uh, performing a study to look at what if we had 5,000 megawatts uh, and what if we had 10,000 megawatts of wind generation on our system. Now, at, at that time, we had about 1,200 megawatts on the system, uh, and so this was really sort of aspirational study. And what stood out to me the most about that study when it came out, I think it was late 2004, early 2005, was, was not the results of the study, uh, but it was really the reaction that had, uh, that, that we would get audacity to uh, study something so ridiculous as 5,000 or even 10,000 megawatts of uh, wind generation on our system. Uh, at, at the time, it was thought that that, that was really, uh, wind was really sort of this, this niche uh, generation source and would never really uh, amount to that much on the system. Uh, now, of course, you know, sitting here in, in 2023, when we have over 37 gigawatts uh, of wind on our system, uh, we, we can look back on that and, and laugh, but I, I think that that perspective is important as we think about these, uh, th these issues and sort of how things have evolved over time. Uh, so shortly after that study came out, the Texas legislature in the spring of 2005 passed a law that uh, required the Public, Public Utility Commission of Texas to designate renewable energy zones and to build transmission to move uh, the, the, the wind generation out of those renewable energy zones uh, to the load center. So if you're not familiar with Texas, uh, most of the good wind resource and the solar resources in the western, less populated part of the state uh, load centers, uh, the big cities, Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio are in the eastern part of the state. And so we needed uh, a lot of transmission to, to move that, that power. And in 2008, as part of that regulatory process, ERCOT released uh, what was known as the Competitive Renewable Energy Zone Transmission, uh, Transmission Optimization Study. And uh, it was a uh, you know, really interesting study. It, uh, uh, ultimately uh, led to the PUC designated, designating uh, rel these renewable energy zones and about $7 billion worth of transmission. Uh, now, uh, a little behind the scenes, a uh, little uh, secret that most people probably don't know is uh, at that time uh, when we were performing that study, we, we did that study in about five months, which is um, pretty phenomenal looking back on that. Uh, but the stability part of that study, we really didn't start that until about Just did that last month, and, and we are uh, performing this analysis. We realized that there are all these stability problems that are showing up in, in the study case. And uh, just in the last few weeks of that study, we ended up adding uh, several new transmission lines, additional transmission lines that weren't uh, in the initial draft plan, as well as a whole bunch of dynamic reactive devices. Uh, and, and we left ourselves some wiggle room where we uh, you know, understood that, that we were going to have to go back and study those dynamic reactive devices a little bit further. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, at, the, at that time, I think we really uh, didn't have the understanding that we have today of the stability issues with integrating large amounts of uh, renewable uh, energy. Uh, so it was al also about that time that we were realizing that th this wind generation was not going to be uh, just uh, sort of a niche generation source. It was actually going to be 
uh, had the potential to be a, a major source of power on the grid. Uh, and across the bottom of the, uh, the slide there, I list several of the uh, initiatives that, that we uh, move forward with uh, grid codes, putting new grid code requirements in for voltage ride through and reactive uh, power uh, requirements, uh, as well as primary frequency response, all, all of the uh, IBRs on the ERCOT system are required to provide primary frequency response, um, and, and that's uh, all, all the time. Uh, so, uh, you know, coming out of that, that uh, CREZ study, uh, we ended up uh, hiring a consultant. Uh, uh, it was ABB at the time. They did this CREZ reactive uh, study for us to look at, okay, what, what do we need for dynamic reactive devices? And through that analysis, I think is when we were uh, starting to get this understanding that the positive sequence models that, that we were using, we were running the analysis, or uh, I think the consultant was running the analysis in PSSE, uh, we realized that there were some limitations to those models. And we were seeing uh, really, the, I think the first glimpses of uh, these kind of weak grade issues and, and um, uh, you know, those, that that need really to do EMT type of studies. Uh, really, uh, up until that time, I, th I think we didn't have that, that full appreciation that we do now. So again, I just wanted to provide some uh, perspective on uh, where we're going. I uh, don't have time to get into all of the, the boxes here today, but uh, suffice to say that there were a number of uh, other studies, a series of, of studies that we looked at where we really started to uh, dive in. We also hired Electronix to come in and, and help us to, to get going uh, with doing the EMT studies. And uh, I think really had a, uh, an evolving understanding of weak grid issues and uh, you know, what, what it was that we needed to do to address those. Uh, so uh, next slide. Thanks, Jeff, you got about three minutes left. Yep, okay. Uh, so, um, I, I did want to uh, just take a minute to uh, talk about what I think is probably an, at least another chapter in, in the ERCOT history, and that is with the uh, the recent IBR disturbance events, um, and uh, listed uh, some of the, the recent ones in the last couple of years on the screen. Uh, I think most notably is probably the uh, what we call the Odessa 2 event, which was about a year ago, uh, and um, uh, we, we've done a number of uh, webinars on that. I think we did a webinar in, uh, I think it was in January with NERC on that. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details on, on that particular event. Uh, but one thing I, I want to note is uh, all of these are really voltage ride through events. Uh, and um, yeah, and so you might be thinking, okay, ERCOT, you were proactive in, in putting all these grid code requirements in. But what, what happened? Uh, with these events. And, and I think that we have uh, still a number of lessons learned uh, from these events. And I, I think I would summarize them as one, I think is modeling, Didi mentioned it, uh, and it probably can't be stressed enough. Uh, matter of fact, I think there's an upcoming webinar on modeling, but I, I think modeling uh, is key. Uh, and also the performance of the units, uh, the, the, the generators uh, performing to uh, what you think and, and what they should be performing to. And then also, uh, just, I, I think uh, the other lesson learned, the third would be uh, just making sure that we have the clarity and the specificity in the requirements that we need. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, I didn't really, um, this is not the topic of, of this webinar, so I didn't really want to go into detail on this slide, but I also didn't want to leave you with the impression that uh, that we're just admiring the problems that we have on our system. Uh, we, we do have several initiatives underway. Uh, it's not related to this, but I'll, I'll note on here that, that we have uh, ha been having discussions within uh, the ERCOT stakeholder groups about a load voltage right through requirement. Uh, that's an emerging issue that we're seeing, and I think others in the industry are all, industry are also seeing. But we'll, we'll save that for another day, and you can go to the the last uh, slide, uh, which I, I think is just a, a question slide, Alex. But I, I guess I'll I'll summarize um, by just uh, saying, you know, as we have thought through ERCOT's history, uh, if I could just leave you with maybe three takeaways that, that are our biggest takeaways for avoiding IBR performance issues. Uh, I think the first is to set your grid code requirements early. Uh, you know, DD mentioned the pain of, uh, hey, we, we had these events, uh, we, we tried to do a SAR, uh, not, you know, industry initially didn't uh, believe us that we needed this SAR, but I think everybody 
you know, uh, sees that now. Uh, but I would say grandfathering is extremely painful. Uh, so uh, get your grid code requirements set correctly as soon as you can. Uh, second would be to get your modeling correct. Uh, and again, there's another webinar on that, so I won't spend a lot of time uh, talking about that one. Uh, and then the third thing I would say is uh, you need to build your stability and your EMT study capabilities. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we really just, you, you know, we're, we're first trying to understand what EMT studies were uh, and how that, you know, really needed to, uh, we needed to have that capability to, to perform the analyses. And, uh, you know, it's taken us a while to, to get where we are today. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Alex. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, very good uh, summary and, and really good uh, kind of topics to hit. We are we're talking about all of them in a little bit more detail. Uh, the next few webinars, there's actually two modeling webinars coming up. So, you know, it is a big issue. It's a big topic. And I'm glad that two out of the three so far have brought it up as a as something to keep an eye on. So uh, thanks very much. See you at the panel in a few minutes. Uh, next up, we have Josh from TVA. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Josh Schultz, I manage the Transmission Operations Group uh, for the Seven State Region at TVA. So, I'll go on to the first slide, just a real quick overview of TVA here. Um, 80,000 square miles, uh, 10 million residents, 198 counties in our Seven State Region, primarily formed around the Tennessee River uh, back with the New Deal in 33. Next slide. Within uh, TVA, we are one of the nation's largest and most reliable. We like to say we're five nines are reliable since 2000. Um, all kinds of interrelated demands. Um, we, we have uh, bulk generation asset performance, all the different things everybody else uh, deals with too. Just a little bit of system assets, 16,000 plus circuit miles, uh, 500 substations, uh, 1,300 uh, customer connection points, about 3,900 miles of telecom and growing quickly there. Next slide, just a little bit more detail on uh, where things are located in general. Um, the, the plants or the nuclear plants, the fossil and, and, and gas plants uh, were located originally around the Tennessee River for cooling capability. But over the years, the gas plants have migrated out to the western part of the system where the pipelines are located. That's also where our solar is tending to land too. It's the less uh, populous areas and a lot more farmland to drop uh, 1,000 acres of solar on. It's uh, much easier to, to build those there. Um, around this, um, you know, we, we have a base load of about 34,000 megawatts. As you can see, it's very diverse uh, from, from coal, coal gas, gas, pump storage, hydro, solar, a little bit of solar and wind, uh, and quite a bit of nuclear as well. Next slide. So for TVA, we're, we're barely uh, dipping our toe into water as compared to to what Jeff and Didi have shared. Um, right now we have about 600 megawatts of transmission connected IBR, uh, five solar plants connected to the TVA bulk electric system today. We have pretty aggressive plans by leadership to support customer needs and demands. Um, by 2035, we plan to go to, to nearly 10,000 megawatts of solar. Uh, very quickly, very aspirational plans, but again, our peaking load's about 34,000. So it'd be a third of our system would be in, in solar at that point. Uh, starting in 21, we, we uh, had a pretty co comprehensive commissioning process. We implemented, again, the, the EMP, EMT modeling processes and requirements. Uh, also, combined with field testing and verification procedures, as well as uh, pretty intensive real-time plant monitoring are, are things that we worked on. So, folks might, folks might want to consider how little we have now in our system, how fast we're going, and then you can compare and contrast how many issues we've had uh, across the journey so far. Next slide. With the commissioning experience, uh, many of our issues we detected during commissioning. Uh, incorrect inverter, uh, power plant controller protection settings, things we've heard before here already. We've also seen real and reactive power oscillations. Uh, we've seen the wrong buses uh, used for voltage control. Um, they, the transformer tap position discrepancies are also occurring. Uh, we recommend one tap they land on another, and then they can't figure out why they can't hold voltage. Uh, localized cap bank control issues uh, to, to offset uh, the reactive penalties there. Also, inverter startup issues. Uh, so the cap bank issues could be we've seen people turning them off too quickly, uh, coming off before they need to and dropping the voltage too much, or um, turning on cap banks even before they've been generating uh, from the inverter uh, as well. Inverter startup issues we've seen trying to start too early with no sun or not enough sun, they'll drop right back off. 
uh, maybe even sev several different times starting too soon and too quickly and dropping back off. Um, we also had issues starting early with another plant. Um, plant would not trip, but kept, in, kept having severe uh, reactive oscillations and, and, and also, which is could be even worse because we're seeing some flicker on the bulk electric system. Most issues we've noted are, are related to model verification. Again, the EMT model verification. Operational testing um, that the, the, the person installing the actual equipment doesn't know how to do the operational testing. And because of that, we've required a 14 day burn in period to where it's a requirement that they must do the burn in period and, and, and have a successful 14 days worth of run without seeing any issues from an oscillation point of view, from an incorrect voltage control, all those different things. And if they do, it resets the clock once they make the change. Next slide. Our commissioning experience continues um, with, um, with model verification. Again, the focus is on the EMT model, um, trying to make sure the quality of the model is correct and checking the functionality within the model. We perform tests within the EMT model, and then we also verify that with field installed equipment. Uh, we also, again, try to do the best effort validation during commissioning test period. That, that includes field testing that has voltage and frequency step tests, uh, reactive power capability. We uh, send them signals from the, the EMS system to make sure they can follow the AGC correctly, and then we give them a rating on how, how well they can follow the AGC. And we, we are testing the whole time with equipment on site for harmonics and transformer energization. Uh, again, just making sure during that 14 day period that we have at the highest quality interconnection that we can get from the, from the folks there. You can kind of see our solar commissioning timeline there to the right. Overall duration about four months. And then again, that 14 day window is kind of toward the end of the process. And it is based on um, subject to change based on the performance during that 14 day including how much weather. If it's completely overcast or we have a tremendous amount of rain during that time, we may ask him to go longer just because of that. Next slide. So uh, getting more operational experience here, most are discovered post commissioning, unfortunately. Um, uh, unexpected performance for large disturbances, uh, have a fault on the system, have momentary cessations, uh, voltage dips, uh, voltage swings. When they are going back, the controller and the operator will go back and try to modify the firmware. We see unintended consequences because of that, as well as if they're tweaking the plant controller due to performance during large disturbances, we end up seeing them go sometimes too fast on the loop control or too high on the loop control, and they end up having oscillations because of that. Um, there's also been a, a time that we had network firewall changes applied to a plant, not the correct one, the wrong one, causing erratic controller operations. So they got in the wrong plant remotely, applied network firewall changes and uh, to the wrong port and causing um, uh, erratic operation. Um, some things we've seen that have helped is real-time monitoring. Uh, we have PMUs and uh, also power quality equipment at each site so we can detect and correct issues before, um, before a lot of times the controller can or the, the plant operator can. And, and we, we can send them messaging uh, and, and also ask them to curtail until they fix it because of that. We do have alarming systems, both for uh, megawatts and megavars, reactive real power oscillations, as well as harmonic oscillations. So in summary uh, from TVA, this, the last slide, please. The commissioning process you know, has been going pretty successfully, especially that 14 day burn-in period where we require them to show good faith performance and do the testing up to that point and then have a good 14 day run. Uh, some gaps that we see that remain would be configuration control post commissioning. Again, we have a good 14 day run, everything's fine. And then they go in and they tweak the PPC or they, they, they tweak something firmware in the controller and things become difficult at that point to figure out what happened. Um, we also, you know, during a testing and burning period, we're not going to perturbate the system with a large disturbance. Um, how to match that real time performance with an EMT testing or dynamic model testing is still pretty lacking to figure that out going forward. And then we also need uh, qualified personnel. Someone else talked about this too, how to handle that reliable transition from roughly seven, 800 megawatts now, less than a gigawatt to 10 gigawatts of, of IBRs by the 2035 aspirational bill. So that, that's it for TVA. I do have a few slides uh, showing uh, solar ramp down, but uh, I'll yield to Alex here and see if we need to stop for a second. We can, uh, you know, 
four or five more minutes if you want to head through those. Okay, let's go through those then. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I'm a very operational kind of guy. I like to to show um, show some experiences through uh, situations on the system. So if you go to the next slide, this is just a map of our western part of the system. Again, most of solar is in the west for us. We had a 500 kV fault, uh, single phase, cleared pretty quickly, four and a half cycles, about the normal clearing time for TVA. Um, there was a solar plant. Uh, this is uh, the fault was in southwest Tennessee, and the solar plant in northwest Tennessee, roughly four or five hundred miles away, uh, electrically pretty distant as well. The solar plant saw uh, an 82% voltage sag uh, for for that bus fault. Pre-event fault, they were running about 100 megawatts, 94 megawatts. Uh, plant entered momentary cessation, nearly dropped to zero with about a 10 minute megawatt uh, per minute recovery. If you go to the next slide, you'll see here the the megawatt output as you're looking from the meter into the plant so shows negative. So again, about 94 megawatts pre-event. The fault occurred. You can see it drops to nearly zero. And it takes a very long time to climb back out of it. So if you go to the next slide, you can see the PMU and the DFR shots here of the of the reactive, uh, you know, as it as it ramps back up, and then you can see the voltage swings there at the local site as it um, as as it recovers from the operator. They said it sounded like the PPC is not properly providing frequency control, um, and it could be causing uh, power to drop to the inverters. If you go to the next slide. Uh, these next four events here are all, they're all uh, caused by the operator trying to fix the previous uh, ramp rate, 10 minute uh, per 10, 10 megawatts per minute ramp rate. So if you look at this one, this is a pretty large oscillation on reactive and megawatt dropout. If you go to the next slide, um, there's another set one here about a week later as they, they, they work through the tuning problems. And if you go to the last one here, this is a last one where they dropped out instantaneously. Uh, again, the, the frequency response of the PPC is not working as um, as they uh, designed it. And again, the first event was caused by a fault on the on the power system that dropped their voltage. They had a momentary dropout to zero. They slowly recovered. We asked them to investigate the 10 megawatt per minute increase uh, ramp rate. And when they did that, they overcompensated. So then, for any twitch, they drop out essentially. The next set of slides here, uh, if you go to the next slide, is that we saw some additional momentary cessation. Again, we have about 700 megawatts of solar installed right now. Uh, this spring, we saw about a third of it drop out. Um, figured out that uh, if you go to the next slide, it was a particular plant. It was about 224 megawatts. Um, we saw um, a, a voltage uh, change as well as the 200 megawatt dropout at the time. You can kind of see all the different uh, recoveries here. Um, there was nothing going on in the power system. There was nothing going on um, at, at the plant that we we're aware. We contacted the plant controller or the plant operator. They were also not aware of anything going on. Um, what happened here was actually a, um, a communication dropout. Uh, they actually had a, a firmware um, a device that was patched that dropped their communication out and they dropped to zero because comms dropped out. So it's all these different things that we're seeing after uh, commissioning, after our 14 day period that we're seeing issues with. And again, we've seen lots of issues. If you just compare that to, um, to how little we have installed already, that's our concern. So Alex, I think that's it for me. Thank you so Thank much you for the opportunity. And no problem. If the rest of the presenters want to throw your camera back on, we'll hop right into our Q and A panel. And we were actually exactly on time, which is I think I'm very surprised, uh, but we're on time. So let's get into the questions. Uh, the first one is kind of, it'll be for everyone. Um, I guess one at a time, so you all can raise your hand. When you're talking about mitigating the performance issues, you know, if it, was there something um, you know, in a past event or in a past analysis, that was kind of like an aha moment or a, you know, an idea moment where um, it was something that gave you all, a, you know, a, you know, the inspiration to change, you know, say maybe tariff language or interconnection requirement or something like that. So, uh, whoever wants to go first, just uh, jump in. Alex, I can call on someone. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, so I'll, I'll take the first shot at that. So I, I think um, every requirement's been a little different for us. I, I think uh, some we've been fortunate enough to, to have um, uh, just some foresight into what was coming and, uh, you know, put them in, in place ahead of time. Uh, others, I, I think um, the, uh, so I, I think some of the issues around uh, modeling, uh, it, it's, you know, that those came out of we, we had an event and you you look at uh, what happened in the event and you, you go back and, and you 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 realize that your your studies didn't show that and why why didn't the study show that well it's because the the models weren't uh, weren't, weren't showing that that behavior uh, and, and so I, I think that you know so some of those are those pain points that that led us down uh, the, the path to really uh, reform. The way that we think about modeling and, and some of the requirements around modeling. Thanks, Jeff. I'd say for TVA, uh, it, it's similar. It's very reactionary. Um, you have an event that causes you to go to investigate, to go figure out what happened, and then try to compare it back to the modeling to see um, see if you can match the real time consequences or results with what actually happened uh, in, in real time versus the model. Um, some things we saw that was interesting was the, um, the ability to do strong source out. We have a pretty um, pretty um, robust 500 kV network, but not as much on the 161 or kind of a delivery voltage. And what we've seen is during that commissioning testing process is we need to do some strong source out type things to see how the plant actually responds in a weaker transmission system condition. Um, with, with that being said, we make changes because of, again, things that happen on the system. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, for, for us in California, so I think I mentioned this early on, and then there's a bunch of questions also in the Q&A. For us, it's the book cut fire, right? And then we, we see this, it's kind of interesting, and, uh, and then we, first we ask the questions of, is, is this California issue, or is this an um, industry-wide issue? And we believe that it is, you know, we believe that it is an industry-wide issue. Uh, we believe that it might be coming to everybody. And so, first and foremost, we approach and work with NERC uh, to develop the SAR because we think that this is not just California. Um, California is the forefront of the number of solars and batteries in there, but it might impact other people too. And for us, is that. You know, being in being in an ISO, we are only one of the nine ISO in in the, in, the, in the North America. We wanted to make sure that you know people who are developing this, the developer community and whatnot, have a have a common ground, have a common understanding, and have have a common uh, standard across the North America. If it is truly an industry-wide issue versus this California issue, but. When, when at that time, I think the industry was not ready, uh, so we went through the, the, the tariff language. Um, and I remember when we went through the tariff language, there was a discussion. But why, why do California? Why do you have to be? Why do you have to be different than everybody else, right? Uh, why, why, do, why do you have to be different? Everybody else is not doing this. Why are you doing this? Um, but you know, it just we, we went through it, and 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 our currently our there's a questions in in the Q and A because. You know why, why? Why do we need NERC to do this? Uh, there are two things. I think one of them is that the fact that you know, like it or not, the developer are the same. The same developer, the same project that are doing this everywhere else. And um, it, to, to us, it doesn't help if we just have you know, if we have multiple different requirements for people who are in North America. That's just not going to be helpful and fruitful for all the uh, for all the developer out there in, in effort to get. Uh, the, the adoption of IBR and lowering uh, uh, the carbon emissions. Uh, but also for us in our tariff, we are putting this in the LGIA, right? We are putting in this generation and connection agreement, which means that uh, it's only applicable for all, uh, all, all resources that is going to touch that interconnection agreement. Either they are changing or they're doing a material modification, which they go through the GIA process or the new stuff that is in there. Uh, the stuff that is in legacy, I don't think we can really touch anything anymore. Uh, now we do have we do have a provisions in our tariff that says that um, in, you know if, in, under BA TOP operation GOP operations we have a provision in our tariff that says that any BA TOP GOP operation TO they, they have to always be. Uh, 
be uh, be, be 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 in compliance with uh, what we call the applicable reliability criteria. And applicable reliability criteria is defined as NERC WAC or you know we are in WAC NERC WAC standards as as as, as it may change from time to time. So we actually have a provision in our tariff that, that requires people to uh, to be in compliance with NERC uh, standards. So if there is a new NERC standard, so for example, when we have a PRC 23, for example, or we have a new standard uh, that comes in, there is an implementation plan for all our BA, TOP, and whatnot to follow with the most up-to-date applicable standard, uh, including the reliability standard. So the hope is that, uh, you know, right now I cannot touch any of the legacy stuff that is in there until there is another r reliable reliability standard that comes in there, and then they follow uh, the, the reliability standard that, that needs to be in there because we have a tariff proficiency in there uh, for any uh, legacy or stuff that has already been connected. So that, that, that's for us, uh, Alex. Uh, hopefully that helps answer many of the Q&A as well in there. Uh, the, current, the current tariff is actually pretty good. Uh, we have an app Appendix EE, Appendix double E, like electrical engineers, uh, uh, that actually have, you know, you, you, must, uh, you, you must do a reactive current. I think there's a question. Why don't you have a standard, you know, reactive grammars. Yeah, we do. We do now. We didn't do it before, but now we have a very complete set of, you know, stuff like, uh, uh, you know, when can you, you cannot have a momentary cessation, or you have to uh, pr provide the reactive currents, and then you have to switch to active current at, after a certain time. But all, all those stuffs are stuff that we learn as we grow. And that's actually uh, helping a lot of uh, reduction of the megawatt. I think there's another question about what do you think that help reduce uh, the megawatt output. Well, it's because the new one are all are all uh, getting better and better. So, uh, it, we're not perfect. Uh, we've still seen we still see a momentary cessation. We still see some of the stuff that is in there, um, but uh, it's definitely it's been better. Thanks, Didi. Yeah, if, if I could oh, just ahead. add a little bit, I I, I uh, agree 100 percent with what Didi. Ten years from now, having a California standard, a Texas standard, a TVA standard, uh, you know, a New York standard, a MISO standard, uh, that, that's not where the industry needs to be. Uh, but the other thing I would add, though, is I, I think that when we work together uh, across, a, you know, the broader industry, I, I think we come up with better standards. Uh, the, 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 I'm a believer in collaboration, and I think that the more that we work together, we're, we're, we're going to have a, a better standard overall. Thanks, Jeff, and Didi, and Josh. Uh, before we get into the next question, I just want to you know reinforce what everyone just said. Right? You know, we got three presentations in three different areas today. Each we're seeing different but relatively similar issues. Right? So, like Didi had said, um, it's not a California issue. It's not a TVA issue. It's not an ERCOT issue. Um, it might sound like that when there's a you know a NERC webinar on one of the disturbances where we talk about that specific area. Um, but we're not picking on them. Uh, not there's not one area that's having all of the issues whose problems are you know their own, right? It's this is a new technology. The grid transformation is happening everywhere. Um, everyone's going to see issues, um, and every, like Jeff just said, everyone's going to need to work together um, to come up with you know kind of like a technical minimum or a base level of of quality for the process. Um, again, you know there there will be maybe some you know, slight regional variance for each network, but like everyone had just said, um, the issues are widespread and the solutions are best if everyone, uh, you know, works together on them. So uh, with that, we're going to go into the next question. Um, so, which is this question I actually wrote before uh, the presentations, but it actually works out pretty well. But um, so, you know, we today and kind of uh, are, you know, we've identified the true, you know, true root cause inputs um, from a lot of these performance issues to be, you know, the lack of detail or validation uh, or verification of the models uh, when compared to the studies that were done in the interconnection process um, and then matching those studies and models to what actually gets commissioned um, you know, before COD. So um, again, this is gonna be a fun for everyone, uh, but first question is, you know, do you agree with that, right? Do you believe or do you agree that maybe the, the biggest root cause would be you know, generally just models did not matching uh, what's being installed um, and, and or if there's a you know a different root cause, y'all think um, you know could be driving these issues. So um, whoever wants to go first can go first. Yeah, so I I would say that the models didn't cause the issues, right? The the models yeah. caused the engineers not seeing the issues ahead of time. The the, mm -hmm. the issues are performance issues uh, that that 
the the generators, uh, what, what, whatever our expectations were, they, they they were not able to perform. And uh, when you, you had the event, then they they tripped off. I mean that that that's the the bottom line cause of the issues is really the the performance and the capabilities. The and sometimes it's not just the capabilities, but it's the the settings uh, for for how those uh, plants were set up. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. It's it's not the models that's causing the the problems. It's the ability for the units to stay online during um, during an event. Um, the models may or may not even catch it, depending on uh, the actual event itself. Now, the modeling could get a lot better, like we talked about, uh, and, and seeing those. I think Didi mentioned uh, get, get, getting a lot of the MT and and both dynamic as well in the real time space would absolutely help, especially um, as we get a weaker system developed for outage season or we have a storm or something roll through that causes us to be weaker. Uh, definitely want to get more modeling and get more um, stability and, and dynamic analysis in there. Thanks. Do you want to jump in or did uh, they cover it for you? Yeah, no, it's 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 true. The model is going to tell you what the model is going to tell you. It's uh, it's. I think the. I, I, I was I was just trying to formulate my quite my answers to some of the Q and A. Maybe I'll just answer it here. In, in reality, what's happening here is that we had all. I think all in California. So all uh, our event that I was talking about is because there is something that happens in the transmission system, right? Something happens and occurs in the transmission system. It's faulted, and the voltage goes low in a transmission system, or the frequency goes abnormal in a transmission system, and then the the operator basically saw loss of megawatt coming out from this IBR. They did not expect that to be lost. Um, so it's really the the issue is the performance portion in there. Now, when we roll back and we slow that down, and when I say slow down, when we actually do step by step slow mo on this, we ask the questions like, well, I cannot really figure out why, or I cannot figure out because I didn't see that in the model. If we were to reconstruct that in in the model, we don't see it. So if we don't see it in the model, how do we even know? whether or not this is a performance issue or whether or not this is a stuff that it should have been that way or it should not have been that way. Without a model that mimics the actual stuff, you don't, you, it's hard to replay back of what could I change to prevent the future performance issue. So, so that's the, 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 the thing about the model is really the, the awareness and the ability for us to have this, what would happen if we change it, right? What would happen if we change it? Would it give us a better performance. Uh, and for us, as, as we get more model, as we get understanding that many of this is, is as simple as making a change in the firmware or say making a change in, in, the, in, the, in the controller, then you actually get a better performance uh, by just a download of a firmware change so, uh, in the inverter. So that's basically, at the end of the day, what we want to have is a better performance of the IBR so that it does not trip or it doesn't cease to provide the megawatt when when we did not expect them to to trip or or cease to provide the megawatt and one way to do that is to be able to know what to tweak to know what to change or what to modify in the software and the applications and you you could do that better if you actually have a, a better model so that's the connections that sounds good yep uh, so it sounds like really the there's two issues right one issue is the IVRs aren't performing uh, their write through capabilities the way that was expected. And uh, the second issue is that what was expected wasn't what was going on, right? Um, what was being, what was modeled and what was studied, you know, both before and after, you know, one of these, one of these disturbances wasn't what was matching the performance of the actual site. Does that sound like a good summary? All right, three nods, I think. I can't see Josh. I think, you know, I'm just going to assume Josh nodded. Yeah, thumbs up is good. Um, cool. Uh, great. We have one more question, uh, about a few more minutes, uh, maybe four more minutes on this one. Um, so NERC has been putting out, you know, and industry's been putting out you know, white papers and reports and guidelines. Um, and we still kind of see these recurring issues with the IBR performance. And sometimes we see, you know, subsequent events that are you know, really similar. 
um, or you know, just you know, variations on a theme of a performance issue. So the real question is, you know, how do we as industry get past the issues, right? How do we stop admiring and, and admiring the issues um, and just investigating the disturbances? And how do we, um, you know, get past it and focus on you know integrating IBRs and making sure they're reliability they're reliable from the start, um, as opposed to just mitigating issues with each disturbance. And whoever wants to, whoever wants to, can jump in. Not a hard one for last. Yeah, I know you saved the hardest one for last, Alex. That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that that is the uh, million dollar question, right? Is <laughs> is uh, yeah, how do we get past this? I I, I think that. Um, I'll say my, my opinion is that we, we are on the right track and we are making progress. Uh, I think as Didi has shown, uh, we, we've seen improvement. He, he's seen improvement on, on uh, the California ISO system. We, we've seen uh, some improvement in ERCOT. Uh, and uh, a lot of it for us is just we, we had to work with every single plant to make sure that they are uh, addressing the issues. Um, I, I think uh, some some of the the, the modeling issues uh, we, we've got some initiatives, and again, I'll, I'll tease a upcoming webinar. I, I think we're, we're going to share more about that in in one of the uh, the modeling webinars. But um, uh, I, I think that there, there's just a lot of uh, initiatives that that we've been working on to to really address that. But I, I would sum them up as. Uh, you, you learn and you, you uh, try to um, educate industry and you try to uh, make sure that you've got your grid code buttoned up and, and you've got it in the right place. And, um, you, you know, I, I think we're making progress, but there's still a little bit of ways to go. I think as as much as we could get standardized across the industry, I think Jeff said that too. That we, each of us have our own set of standards. If if each interconnect has their own standard, it's it's going to be pretty much similar. I think across the the interconnects, as well as the standards for maybe even the PPCs and the, and the manufacturers, because we we kind of see everybody's just a little bit different about how they handle everything, uh, the ramps and the controllers and the and the calm dropouts, all those different things we've seen is, is different for each person who's putting one of these in. And, and we're all going to get better as we get more on the systems. Just, just like, you know, Cal SO has gotten better as they, as they have done it. We've learned from them and people are going to learn from us. Uh, but I think standardization is a big part of that. And if we could drive to that with with uh, some requirements, that, that could be potentially helpful. Thanks, Josh. And we have just a couple minutes. So I'm going to pivot to one question from the chat that goes into exactly what you just said. Um, in the Question asker asks, uh, you know, in what what role do you think you know a standard like twenty eight hundred, uh, triple twenty eight hundred twenty twenty two could help um, industry with this standardization process? Because we heard some, I think both of you or two of you have said, you know, it would be good to have some collaboration and, and standardization of a you know technical minimum set of requirements. Um, but there's a lot of work put into triple twenty eight hundred twenty twenty two. Um, do you all see that as a, you know, a viable place to start? Um, for for looking for standardized requirements, or what are your all thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would say yes. So, so um, uh, without getting in too much detail, so so uh, I think the voltage ride through has been the the biggest uh, performance issue that we've seen on our system. Uh, so we are going through the stakeholder process, the ERCOT stakeholder process, right now to uh, adopt uh, part of twenty eight hundred. Uh, it, it's not a wholesale adoption at this point, but we really felt it was important to uh, to take the the voltage ride through part of 2800 and adopt that into our grid code. And so we're we're going through that stakeholder process right now. Thanks, Jeff. I, I'm an operations guy, Alex, so I'm not as much <laughs> familiar with the, the the standard you're you're talking through. It's more on the interconnect side, but anything that gets us closer to standardization, I think, is is the best way to approach it. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Did you any quick thoughts? Yeah, about a minute. Hey, I, I I I I am the same with uh, Josh. I 
am uh, I'm an ex, I'm an ex engineer that so try to be a management right now, so I don't follow the <laughs> IEEE 2800 2022, uh, so I cannot really comment on that. Uh, so. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, and we're about out of time. So thanks everyone uh, for joining the panel. Um, very good presentations and really appreciate your time putting together the, the slides and joining us here for, for this hour. Um, we have another session on Thursday, same time, uh, June 15th. Uh, and that's going to be our fourth webinar and that'll be on establishing and enhancing interconnection requirements. So um, a really nice continuation of what we've seen here today. And um, I'll see you all then. See you guys in a couple of days. Thanks. Thank you. See you.